Tando Sipuye. I hope that's right. If not, we'll talk about it later. Okay. Um, uh, Tando is from um, the Robert Sabukwe Foundation, um, and you'll be seeing an exhibition a little bit later on Robert Sabukwe. So my question, uh, Tando, what can we all learn from the life of Sabukwe, and especially today's generation? Thank you. Um, thank you so much for the question, and I greet you, and I greet my fellow panelists, and I think I want to firstly take this opportunity to apologize for arriving late. Um, I also think that uh, before I, I answer that question, it is quite significant that uh, we are here gathered and, and discussing you know, um, issues around our heritage and poisoned pasts, particularly in this month of uh, November, especially in relation to Robert Sobukwe. And I just want to say, uh, highlight the fact that it was on the 1st of November 1977 that uh, Robert Sobukwe was readmitted at Khrotskir Hospital in Cape Town after he had been discharged on the 15th of October 1977, following an operation that was conducted him, on him by Dr. Bernard. Sobukwe had been admitted at uh, Hrotskir, in fact, on the 12th of September 1977. And uh, he was operated on without the knowledge of his family, without his wife, Mama Zondeni Sobukwe, being informed for an alleged uh, cancerous lung tumor. And so I, I, I just want to say that it is quite significant that we are discussing that. But the other point that I want to mention in relation to Sobukwe is that Sobukwe did not die a natural death. Sobukwe is one of the many people, revolutionaries, here in this country who were systematically assassinated through various means. Uh, Mama Sobukwe in 1995 testified before the Truth Commission and said that Uba Sobukwe, while he was incarcerated indefinitely on Robben Island, he was poisoned. He was given food with glasses. And you would know that Sobukwe was isolated all alone for six years on Robben Island. And uh, he was subjected to that. And I want to locate the poisoning and the systematic assassination of Sobukwe within the context of the discussion of uh, Project Coast, you know, started by, uh, which was led by Voter Basson, Dr. Death, and uh, with people like uh, P.W. Bota, who were president, the state president at that time. And Project Coast was a project that was intended on developing synthetic chemical and biological weapons that would be used against particularly the African revolutionaries, black freedom fighters to be specific. And, uh, you know, there are a number of synthetic diseases, a number of um, chemical poisons that were developed by that program, um, Furthermore, we know that they also developed a number of drugs that would be distributed in the black community, things such as the ticks and the mandrax and so forth. You know, and so for me, I, I want to, to, to move from that premise and say that here I want to speak about Sobukwe as one of those many revolutionaries who were poisoned deliberately, systematically assassinated. Because very often when we speak of Sobukwe, we say that he died, and people would assume that he died a natural death, because it's said that uh, he died of cancer in 1978. But Sobukwe was killed by the collaboration of the racist apartheid state together with the medical establishment. People such as Dr. Bernard, who operated him, without the knowledge or the consent of his family. 
you know, and others who are still alive for uh, even if I can mention that, you know. And one of the things I should say is that there's never been even a so-called commission of inquiry or even an inquest into the murder of Robert Mangaliso Sobukwa. So I want to move from that premise first and foremost. And then um, secondly, I want to say that Sobukwe was a man of noble character, a visionary leader, a thinker, a pragmatic political activist, and an ideologue. Sobukwe was also a very simple man. He was a Methodist church preacher. He was a teacher. He was also a university lecturer. And in saying he was a university lecturer, I want to emphasize that point too. Because in history and when we read, he's referred to as, a, as an assistant in the Department of uh, African Studies at Vets University. But Sobukwe, in fact, he was lecturing them. He was busy on a lecturing post on a daily and consistent basis, lecturing African languages at Vets University. Sobukwe was a grounded man. He was a gardener. He was a father. He was a husband, a brother. And Sobukwe was an outstanding man, a political leader, a prisoner, a graduate, an economist, a lawyer, the man most feared by the racist apartheid authorities. And he was deemed by men such as Foster as the most dangerous man in South Africa. And so this is the man that I want to speak about here today. And so you ask the question, Wuti, how can we, uh, you know, a, a, as young people, what can we learn from him? What can we draw from Sobukwe? One of the things I want to say is that in post-1994 South Africa, we have a tragedy of what uh, Chimamanda Ngozi says is the telling, the danger of singular narratives, the danger of single stories. In post-1994 South Africa, we tell history from a singular political trajectory. Uh, my elder here mentioned earlier as I came in that there are some political figures that are celebrated in this country more than others. Heritage figures. And Sobukwe is one of the silenced voices in this country. I mean, I don't have to mention for you all here that there is not even a single public archive that is available of Sobukwe's voice. And yet you have archives dating back into the 50s and the 60s and the 70s and so forth. But you cannot go into any archive in this country. You cannot go into any archives or uh, media archives and find interviews, you know, where you can hear the sound of Sobukwe's voice, how he may have sounded. So for many young people here today, I, would, I usually say that we have no clue how Sobukwe may have sounded because he is one of those uh, men whose voices remain silenced even in post-1994 South Africa because of this tragedy of the telling of history from a singular political uh, trajectory. We loud other leaders above others. And I think this is, it is a danger that we cause as a nation if we tell history from, uh, you know, from these narrow singular perspectives celebrate others. I mean, in speaking of Sobukwe, I usually like to speak about Mama Sobukwe. Many people didn't know, even know that Mama Sobukwe was alive. Just recently, people, this nation awoke and knew that the widow of uh, Uba Umanga, Liso Sobukwe, was alive. And I want to state, earlier in the year, uh, the state president, uh, honored Mama Sobukwe and gave her the order of Lutuli in silver. And I want to inform you here that it was not out of their own volition. It was not that the government woke up and decided that now they love Mama Sobukwe and they want to, you know, uh, celebrate her. It was because of the efforts of young people in Soweto. 
the Black House Collective who nominated Mama Sobukwe. And I was part and parcel of those young people. But further than nominating Mama Sobukwe to receive an order from government, and it was a way of saying to the government, recognize this woman. Here she is, 90 years old, having served, suffered, and sacrificed for this nation. She is living isolated in Khraf Reynet without any care, without any, you know, any care from this government. And so we wanted the government to actually acknowledge her and celebrate her, but further than nominating Mama Sobukwe to receive an order from government, we actually wrote a letter to the state president at that time and said that the government should consider actually naming one of the national orders after Mama Sobukwe because of all the so-called national orders that we have in this country. None of them are named after a woman. None of them are aimed at celebrating women figures in this country who have contributed in shaping our history. But you have two of them named after men, Albert Lutuli and Oar Tambo. You see? And so we said to the government, honor this woman, honor other women by uh, you know, instituting a new national order. Of course, we know that that, was, uh, you know, that, uh, that request was not honored by the government. But coming back to what uh, young people can learn from Sobukwe. Sobukwe taught us the ideals of self-determination, self-reliance. We must be proud of who we are. Sobukwe came at a time, you know, the, the whole discussion of Project Coast and the engineering of chemicals and, and all of that, it comes within a, a broader context, a broader history of you know, the Darwinian movement, the eugenics movement, and all the racist uh, pseudosciences that they were creating to try and justify and prove that African people were inferior. And men such as Sobukwe and others, because Sobukwe himself learned from others before him, uh, people such as uh, Dr. Chik Anta Diop, who proved that actually African people are not an inferior race or, of people, and that African people, in fact, are the origin and the beginning of it all. That humanity originates in Africa, but not only humanity, civilization originates in Africa. The first institutions of learning higher learning originator still found in Africa today. You know, the, the, the founders of the sciences that we learn today, the academic sciences, were here, right here in Africa. Most of the so-called Greek philosophers that are lauded and hailed in all the university and institutions, most of them learned here in Africa, you know, for a number of years. And so Sobukwe came in that context, and these are some of the teachings he taught us, that African people, you are not an inferior race. You, in fact, are part and parcel of what he called the human race. And African people are, in fact, the origin of that human race. I mean, it was Chick under Diop who said that there is only one race, and that is the African race. And that race has its origin in Africa. You see, and furthermore, he said, Chick under the op, that all others are mutations out of the African. And I think that science has proven this over time that indeed African people, you know, are a supreme people, a supreme uh, a nation of people. And I think these are some of the lessons that we can draw from Sobukwe. You know, African philosophy, loving ourselves, loving our history loving where we come from as a people, and acknowledging, you know, our oneness with the experiences of our ancestors. I usually say that we are one with our ancestors, and our ancestors are one with us. Whatever African people experienced under slavery, under colonialism, under apartheid, is still with us today. So, rightfully, we, we not only talk of the past as something that is away somewhere there. The past is ever present with us and we live with the past. You know, it's continuously manifested in our daily lives. I stay in Soweto. I know it for a fact. 
you know, we see the past and we see, you know, um, the effects of racism, white supremacy, which people such as Sobuko were fighting against, the engineering of, um, you know, our spaces, you know, where we live as African people and the effects it has on our psyche, you know, and our uh, mental health as, as African people. I think I will end it there.